Well, hey guys, in today's video, I'm gonna be answering the question, do red light masks pose a risk to fat loss in the face? I know this is a area of great concern to many of you. As you'll recall from my video on how your face changes with age, over time, the fat pockets in our face, they decrease in volume and size, and that contributes to the appearance of sunken hollows, dark under eye circles. There's a lot of talk online about various devices and things causing premature fat loss in the face, unwanted fat loss. When we think about devices and types of energy delivered to the skin surface that do pose a risk for fat loss, primarily we're talking about radio frequency and ultrasound because these types of energy when delivered to the skin have the potential to heat the skin and could potentially cause fat loss prematurely. Now, as a reminder, last week I did a whole video on do radio frequency treatments like radio frequency microneedling, Morpheus 8, do these cause unwanted, unintended fat loss? So check that video out. I do a deep dive there in that video all about radio frequency energy, how it works, and address your concerns around fat loss. But to cut to the chase with red light, you're not generating heat in the skin. You're not causing shrinkage of fat. You're not targeting the fat cells. Furthermore, there are no reports, observations of fat loss as a result of red light therapy. Taking a step back, what exactly is red light? Red light is a type of visible light. When we say light, we're actually referring to three different types of energy. There's infrared radiation, ultraviolet radiation, and visible light. Red light is visible light. Now, all three of those, infrared radiation, ultraviolet radiation, and visible light, they all come from the sun. They all can be utilized to treat and benefit the skin in various ways under controlled conditions. And they all three can potentially harm the skin depending on how they're delivered, the dose, etc. Of those three, you have visible light. Think of it as your rainbow. Visible light is light that can be detected by the human eye. Now, red light can be delivered to the skin through a variety of devices for therapeutic benefit in dermatology. Lasers, light emitting diodes, otherwise known as LEDs, flash or arc lamp, and red light also can come from fluorescent lights. The at-home masks that you might do, say for rejuvenation, improving the look of wrinkles and fine lines, those are going to be LEDs. LED red light therapy, it's a safe and effective treatment for a variety of issues in dermatology. Hair loss, acne, rejuvenation, meaning improving the look of wrinkles and the signs of skin aging. It's also beneficial for wound healing. It can treat skin cancers when combined with a medication that makes the skin more sensitive to red light. And it also can be used to treat pre-skin cancers for patients who make a lot of pre-skin cancers known as actinic keratoses. The mechanisms are still being worked out, but overall it's one of photobiomodulation. Within the skin, you have something called chromophores. These are things that absorb light of different wavelengths. Now the main chromophores for visible light in our skin are going to be melanin, hemoglobin, and these receptors known as opsins. Now, as I said at the beginning of the video, red light, while it can have these benefits to the skin for acne, photorejuvenation, hair loss, etc., it certainly does have the potential to cause harm to the skin. We can have a conversation about the negative effects of visible light on the skin without first discussing the risk of hyperpigmentation. Over the years, we have come to learn that blue light, which is in the visible light spectrum, but it's not red light, so blue light, uh, specifically blue light, in people who have medium to deep skin tones, blue light can actually trigger more early onset and more stubborn hyperpigmentation. And this is thought to occur through those photoreceptors, opsin 3 specifically. Now this can happen with visible light that you get from sun exposure. Roughly 15 to 30 minutes of sun exposure can lead to this, studies suggest. But again, that's blue light, uh, not likely with red light. One study looked at the safety of red light LEDs in people who do have deeper skin tones, skin of color. And they showed that dosages up to 320 joules per centimeter square were actually safe in people who have deeper skin tones. 
to be clear, that's pretty high and much higher of a dose than what you would ever receive from one of those at-home red light masks or any at-home red light device for that matter because red light in the at-home devices, it's not just the red light masks. You also have a variety of handheld devices. And then when we're talking about hair loss, you have caps, combs, and helmets. Now there are a handful of skin conditions that are sensitive to visible light. Solar urticaria is basically hives that develop with sun exposure. And anywhere from 14 to 90% of patients with solar urticaria can also develop hives with exposure to visible light. Now that might be visible light from the sun, but theoretically it could come from one of these devices. You also have these hereditary conditions known as porphyrias or Porphyria can be acquired in a certain situation. And with the porphyrias, you can be sensitive to visible light. But for those folks with sensitivity, it's, it's actually blue light that's, that's a problem. Then there's polymorphous light eruption. I have a whole video talking about polymorphous light eruption. This is, this is the, probably the, one of the most common uh, skin conditions with photosensitivity. With polymorphous light eruption, the main uh, trigger is actually UVA that comes from the sun. But a subset of people can actually have their skin condition triggered by visible light as well. There's a, there's a photosensitive condition that happens mostly in older men uh, over the age of 50 called chronic actinic dermatitis. Basically, you get an itchy eczema type rash in sun exposed areas or areas exposed to artificial lights. And that can be, in some cases, triggered by visible light as well. So something that would need to be considered before pursuing in, in those individuals. Some people with the autoimmune disorder, uh, systemic lupus erythematosus, um, most of those patients are photosensitive, meaning they go out in the sun and get a really horrible rash and actually kind of flare some of their symptoms of like joint pain. How exactly does red light work anyway? Well, photobiomodulation is a process that um, there's a lot more research going on about it but it appears as though it works in um, one of a few ways. First of all, by increasing production of ATP, which is the energy currency of the cells. So when the cells have more energy, they're able to perform better. The other possibility is that red light triggers uh, expression of certain genes and pathways that are important for healing, recovery, and collagen synthesis. In terms of photo rejuvenation, there are good studies showing that red light therapy stimulates the fibroblasts in your skin to produce healthy collagen. So that's going to obviously play a role in the wrinkle smoothing effects that one might observe with red light therapy. Now, in order for red light therapy to have a biological effect, it's going to depend on a few parameters. Uh, the dosage, the power density, the treatment duration, and how the energy is delivered. Is it delivered in pulses or continuously? And then the treatment regimen or the frequency of administration. Red light is delivered with parameters that are not triggering any sort of thermal effect. Therefore, there is no risk of premature shrinking or destruction of the fat cells, the adipocytes, the, those, those fatty compartments. Many dermatologists utilize red light therapy in their practices, including for non-cosmetic indications. They're not seeing any cases of premature fat loss. It doesn't make sense how that would occur. It's never been reported. And the settings that are used and the, the dosages that can be used from devices that are for in-office use, meaning what your dermatologist uses, they are much stronger than what is delivered from an at-home device. The at-home devices, they are much weaker. They are thought to be beneficial, however, as more of an adjunct. Um, they can certainly have benefit, but it's never going to be as as notable as what you get with an in-office treatment. They, they certainly can help and a lot of people use them. The thing about the at-home red light treatments, whether it be mask or wand or however you're choosing to deliver it, you have to keep using them uh, in order to maintain the results. So if it's something that you feel like you are not going to comply with, that you're not gonna have the time to do, I never recommend getting them in that case. But if you are highly motivated and you plan to stick with it, you believe you can stick with it, then yeah, I mean, they don't, they don't harm the skin and they do appear to be beneficial for some in improving the visible signs of skin aging. In office, LED phototherapy with red light is used um, to complement a variety of other standard aesthetic procedures like uh, filler or neurotoxin, peels, IPL, 
um, it's often used to complement those as an adjunct to yield further benefit. In order to get the best results out of your at-home device, I do recommend using it as directed by the manufacturer. For example, if you have a face mask, I don't recommend trying to use it like to your hands because they've calibrated the lights and, and the device to treat a given area. Skin thicknesses vary a lot from location to location. So I don't recommend using a, a, a light device at a body site where it's not intended for use. Also, make sure that you use it uh, for the amount of time that they recommend and the frequency. So if it's meant to be used twice a week, do it twice a week. Um, and then after that, use it as frequently as recommended for maintenance because it is something that you need to continue to use in order to maintain the benefits that you see. Now, of course, you don't have to use it as frequently for the maintenance regimen typically, but if you fall off, you may start to lose that effect, and then you may have to go back to doing it a little bit more frequently for some time to get back to those results. And set your expectations from the get-go that this is not going to be as effective as what you would get with an in-office treatment because the doses are not going to be as high, but they certainly can be effective and may be complementary to what you have already gotten with an in-office treatment. Last thing I wanna mention is about the safety of red light when it comes to the eyes. Um, red light does have the potential to be harmful to your eyes. Now, again, the at-home devices, they do use a very, um, you know, a much weaker dosage compared to what you would get with in-office treatment, but it is prudent to protect your eyes. Um, and, you know, the devices are such that they don't, shouldn't be exposing your eyes. It's a low risk, but uh, I, I did want to mention that. All right, y'all, that's what I wanted to talk about for today's video to piggyback off of some of my other recent videos about devices and treatments causing premature fat loss. Now, on the end slate, I'm going to link my recent video talking all about Latisse causing periorbital, meaning around the eyes, fat loss and sunken eyes. So check that one out next if you missed it. But if you guys like this video, give it a thumbs up, share it with your friends, and as always, don't forget, sunscreen and subscribe. I'll talk to you guys tomorrow. Bye.